Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Metaphysical Hour. And tonight is Friday, September 23rd, and um, we're live, and let's see, <laughs> I just went blank. Here, I, I rehearsed all this right before, seconds before, and see, that's what happens. My brain falls out as soon as he goes live. <laughs> so, let's see, September 23rd, and, um, oh, 2016, that's what I forgot, um, and so excited, uh, Garnett and I were talking right before we were going live here uh, about um, trips to Ireland, because uh, I just returned from Ireland, and he had been, I think you said, a year ago, Garnett? A year ago, yes. Yeah, that's so cool, about the same time of the year, too, So, and it's a beautiful time of the year to go. Yeah, it was wonderful, yeah, we had great weather. Yeah, it's it's just gorgeous over there. Um, so let me go ahead and give a little bit of I like the call in information, and then we'll go ahead and and let you let you talk. <laughs> so um, so our toll free number, if anybody wants to call in with questions for Garnett, is one eight 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 six two seven six zero zero eight one eight 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 Six two seven six zero zero eight. Like I said, I just finished classes in Ireland, and then I'll be going uh, the first part of October to Toronto, Canada. I'll be. Is that anywhere close to you, Garnet? No, it's uh, on the other side of the country. Okay, I was thinking that. I think you're over. Are you close to Vancouver? Or yeah, yeah, we're close to Vancouver. Yeah. Okay, you're in that. I'll be over that way next year. So um, that'd be cool. Um, Anyway, so we'll be, I'll be over there, um, like the, from the second through the middle of the month and, uh, doing classes in Toronto. And so if anybody's interested in, uh, QHHT classes, just check online, DoloresCannon.com or the QHHTofficial.com and see what we've got going. And meanwhile, uh, well, let's get going with our special guest. I always love talking to you, Garnett. You, your adventures are just so exciting. <laughs> it's kind of like that's what it's like the ongoing adventures of Garnett and Albert. Let's see what comes next. <laughs> so, um, so let's a um, little bit about your background. If there's anyone who who doesn't know you, you started as an attorney. Uh, you're retired now, correct? That's right. Yep. And you, um, I'll let I'll kind of give the the brief synopsis. But you, um, you met your. I mean, you didn't start out in this metaphysical world and everything, and you just kind of hit it with a bang when your your guide just stops you in the middle of the street one day, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I like the way you say it better, the way you tell the story, but, um, and I'll let you tell the story, but that's what start, starts your books, because what we're going to talk about tonight is your third book. Um, you know, your first one is Dancing on a Stamp, and the second one is Dancing Forever with Spirit, and then this book is Dancing, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, and each one is talking about the progression of your adventures, and the first one, like I said, is the beginning of your story, and then it, the next ones is, are the progression. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you reveal how you want to the the story. So carry it away, Garnet. Sure. Well, uh, <laughs> for, for those who aren't familiar with my story, I first met my spirit guide, Albert. It was back in 2007. I was still practicing law. And I was walking down the street one sunny afternoon in May, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a homeless man just jumps in front of me. And he looked like a very typical homeless man with sort of a, you know, stringy hair and scraggly beard and dirty clothes and, uh, you know, very typical. And, but instead of going around him like I typically did when I encountered these people on the street, I just stood there because he had these amazing sparkling blue eyes that just uh, that were penetrating deep within me. They seemed to be looking right down into the depths of my soul. And at the same time, it was, he was sending me this wave of pure, unconditional love that was just infusing my whole body with an amazing sense of peace and security and well-being. So it was an amazing feeling. And I stood there like a deer caught in the headlights, 
I was sort of like in a time warp. I had no idea how long I stood there. Didn't really care because I really enjoyed uh, basking in, in the uh, loving gaze of this homeless man who I'd never met before. Um, mm. And then he, uh, he broke the spell by saying to me, why are you here? And then he quickly disappeared into a nearby store. And when I finally collected my wits, I went into the store to try to find him. But he was nowhere to be seen. I went back out on the street, walked up and down for 10 or 15 minutes trying to spot him. But he had seemingly disappeared into thin air. So I resolved as I was walking back to my office after that, resolved that I had to go back the next day to try to find this man. So I did. Very next day, same time, same street. I uh, walked up and down hoping I could spot him. And then after probably about 10 or 15 minutes of searching, I, sp I spotted him sitting all alone on a bench. So I walked up to him and I said, who are you and why did you stop me the other day? And he said, oh, I'm a soul just like you. I'm here to answer your questions and help you on your journey. And that was the beginning of a dialogue that I had with him that went off and on for the next several months. And I found out uh, early on that his name was Albert and he was really one of my spirit guides in disguise. And he told me that I, I was the only one who could see him in physical form. And I actually, not only could I see him, but I could touch him. And he said he only appeared to me and to no one else. And so had other people been walking by the street, uh, by the bench that day, they would have seen me sitting there talking to myself, basically, because no one else was there. So um, he, he said that he had come to answer my questions, um, all, the, all the big questions in life that we all ask at one time or another, like, who am I? Why am I here? What's my purpose in life? And what happens to me when I die? And I'd been searching for those answers because I had been raised as a Roman Catholic, and then sort of in my 20s and 30s, I had rejected a lot of the things that they had taught me, and I was looking for some new, fresh answers that rang true. And Albert, my guide, was there to do that, and he did so, answered a lot of my other questions as well. And, uh, and at, at some point in the conversation, he, he said to me, you know, I'm not just here to, to satisfy your curiosity. I want you to write a book about the revelations I'm giving to you so they will be available to everyone, which took me back a bit because I'd never even dreamed of writing a book. It just wasn't on my radar screen. And so I was a bit reluctant, uh, but uh, he was very gently persuasive. And after a time, I sort of resigned myself to the fact that, okay, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to do this guy's bidding and write my book. And as you know, Julia, from your experience, uh, there's no point in trying to argue with spirit because eventually they're going to win. That's so, the truth. <laughs> and, and, and so Albert did win. And so I ended up writing the manuscript for my first book, Dancing on a Stamp, which was published in 2013. And that was just a, a dialogue, a series of questions and answers I had with Albert with some very interesting revelations, a lot of which flew in the face of what Christian holy men had been preaching for centuries. So there's a lot of, a lot of new things. But I knew right away, as soon as I heard them, that these, this was the real goods. This was the truth. It just felt right to me. It felt true in my heart. And I knew that he was telling me the, the, the real truth about, uh, you know, the, the cycle of reincarnation on earth and, uh, and what happens to us after we die. And so after I uh, had that pu book published, he, uh, Albert reappeared in my life once again in somewhat of a different format. I was sleeping in my bed and I heard something and I sort of woke up and sat up in bed and I saw this sort of ghost-like ethereal figure standing in the doorway of my bedroom. This was in the dead of night, like two or three in the morning. Um, and as this figure sort of moved closer towards the foot of my bed, I recognized who it was. It was my old friend Albert, except now he was in astral form. And I said, you know, hi, Albert, what brings you here this time? He said, I'm here to take you on a series of out-of-body adventures, some astral traveling. I'm going to take you to the spirit side, to other places in the universe, other places on your planet, uh, because I want you to write about what you hear and see on these trips. And I want you to write a second book about what you, what you encounter. And I said, well, okay, I guess uh, I don't really have any choice, so let's go. So he literally reached out, grabbed my astral hand, pulled my astral body out of my physical body. I turned around and looked behind me, and there my physical body was still sound asleep in bed. And he just said, follow me. He grabbed me by the hand. We rose up through the ceiling, up through the clouds, and then hovered above our beautiful planet for a while uh, to let me sort of catch my breath. And then he uh, took me through a shimming doorway to the spirit side. That was my very first uh, you know, trip to the spirit side. 
And all those adventures were detailed in my second book, uh, Dancing Forever with Spirit. And then when I had finished that set of adventures and finished the manuscript for that book, he came back into my life again, this time in, in similar format, uh, a, a appearing in astral form in my bedroom. And we went on another series of astral adventures to the spirit side to meet some very interesting people to different places in the universe and, and other places on our planet. And again, it was for the purpose of providing, of, of allowing me to write about what I saw in my book to provide uh, me and all of humanity with uh, a, a lesson or provide us with a nugget of wisdom. And that second set of astral trips was, uh, has been chronicled in my third book, Dance of Heavenly Bliss, which was released just in uh, this last March. And so that's where we are now. He has, in fact, come back into my life subsequent to the third book for another set of adventures. He just seems, he's like the ever ready bunny. He never seems to give up or tire out. And so, and so um, the, the third set of astral trips uh, I've chronicled in the fourth, my fourth book, the manuscript which, of which I submitted to Ozark Mountain Publishing in July for their consideration. So that's where I am now. I don't know if uh, he's going to come back again. I certainly hope he does. But in the meantime, it's been a hell of a ride for sure. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask you, is, like, uh, is there an indication of what more is out there? You know, he's, he's, he's very sort of, he, he keeps his, uh, uh, his cards close to his chest. He doesn't really tell me much about what he's planning for me. And in fact, all through all my adventures, he would never say, you know, I'm coming back on Friday. I'll see you then. He, he would never tell me when he's coming back. He would just suddenly show up. So it might be two nights in a row or it might be two weeks apart. I never really knew that. And I never really knew where we were going. He would never tell me in advance. So it was always sort of a, a big surprise. So will he come back into my life? I, I hope so. Um, but he's not telling me. And even though I asked the question several times, he just said, you know, wait and see. Time will tell. You know, if I come back, I'll be there. And if I don't, I won't. You know, he's very, uh, he's, he's very hard to read. That's interesting. I haven't seen yet what's in the fourth book. I'll have to ask Nancy about that. But um, because I'm, I'm, but I've already seen what you I mean. Like what's what where you've already been taken is amazing. And it's like wow. I mean, you know. I mean, I'm I'm aware that. I mean, what I'm aware of is is, is still a tip of the iceberg. I'm sure, and that's probably so much more than a lot of people are aware of. And then it's like, uh, it's a. I can't even fathom what is probably really out there. <laughs> so, just. Well, well, for sure, I, I, I fully believe I'm only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And mm -hmm. uh, like, like your dear mother, Dolores, has said yeah. often, uh, that spirit sort of feeds us this information slowly so that we can absorb it and not become overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm glad for that because if he sort of showed me the whole picture, I think I might just uh, go bonkers because I think there's so much out there. And so I'm, yeah. getting, it, I'm getting it fed slowly. Uh, you know, it, it, it's slow enough so that I could write about it in my in my books and not being overwhelmed. And so, um, but there's a whole lot of more information that I've seen. That's for sure. Oh, you've seen so much. It's amazing. It's a, oh, it's fantastic. So let's talk about what uh, Dance of Heavenly Bliss. Let's talk about what's some of the things that are in this one. Okay. Well, one of the interesting things, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in terms of my my trips on Earth was that he took me initially to. Uh, a, a water park in in uh, in California, where I had a conversation. I'm traveling in astral form with Albert, of course. Had a conversation with a a killer whale, an orca, and that was quite fascinating because uh, uh, th th this creature uh, I found out was a very intelligent, sensitive, empathetic creature um, who uh, had you know amazing em emotions and feelings, uh, much more so than humans tend to attribute to animals like killer whales and dolphins and so on. And so had a great conversation with, with, this, with, with this orca. Uh, her name was Yolanda. She lamented the fact that all she really wanted to do was to be able to roam and live freely in the Pacific Ocean where she was born until she was captured by humans and put in this, uh, in this aquarium. And she lamented the fact that she's, you know, like a prisoner there. She has to perform silly tricks for the spectators who don't know about her plight or don't seem to care about uh, what she really wants. And her plea was, you know, please, humans, can you please free me and all of my colleagues who are captured in these aquariums? Can you please ask humans to quit trapping and killing, um, you know, 
whales, my cousins, uh, dolphins, uh, you know, catching us in, uh, in, in hunting uh, ships and uh, we get entangled in nets and traps and, uh, and, and we're just, you know, being abused sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. And we have to suffer through the abuse that humans are, are pouring into our oceans where we live. And she, her, her plea was really, can you go and ask your fellow humans to try to stop the abuse, to recognize that we're really intelligent and sensitive creatures. We want to live in harmony with humans. Uh, you know, we, we, we have no, no case against humans. We just wish that they would respect us as, uh, as intelligent beings and, uh, and, and stop abusing us. So it was really a heartfelt plea from this lovely creature who really wanted to go back into the Pacific to, to roam freely uh, and, and to be free from, uh, from intervention by humans, whether it be intentional or unintentional. And so that was the message that she asked me to take back to my fellow humans, which I included in a chapter in my third book. So it, it was really quite, it, you know, really quite amazing to, to, to know that these creatures actually communicate with each other but through telepathy. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, they're way more advanced than humans because most humans can't communicate by telepathy. I could do so because Albert, you know, arranged for it and I was traveling in astral form. But in my human form, I can't communicate by telepathy. I'm sort of like one of the many millions of other people in the same boat. And Albert has always said, you know, we have the capacity uh, to communicate by telepathy. We just have to learn to utilize more of our brain power. And then, and then if we did, then we could hear the, the, the thoughts of these creatures, understand what they really are, and we would have a better, a, a different look, a different perspective on who they are and, 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 and what they really want to have happen. So it was really a, a, a quite an important message. And I hope that, uh, you know, more and more humans will begin to recognize uh, that we really have to treat the, the other animals on our planet with dignity and respect. Oh, that's a, that, absolutely. That's a beautiful story. Um, okay. And, no. and then, uh, yeah, I'll just continue if, if you wish. Yeah, you absolutely. To. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so another very fascinating um, uh, encounter I had on our planet, and this is before I, I had a, a number of uh, encounters on the spirit side, but on our planet, he actually took me, uh, we're, we're traveling astrally, he took me to a cavern underneath the North Pole. And I wondered why he was taking me there because there was nothing in this cavern, you know, just the usual stalactites and the other things you find in caves. All of a sudden, I heard a, a, a voice, and it was a, a, a beautiful, kind, compassionate voice. And this voice said that she was Gaia, the consciousness of Mother Earth. And that surprised me a bit because I'd always thought that, you know, our planet was nothing more than a conglomeration of inert molecules forming rocks and mountains and desert and soil mm -hmm. and so on. And she says, no, um, you know, I'm, I'm actually a living entity. I have a consciousness. And she told me that she's very fiercely protective of all of her flora and fauna on our planet. And she wants everyone to live in harmony. She wants to have a balanced and peaceful ecosystem for, you know, all of her plants and animals to live in. And her message to me was not unlike the, the, the orca that I talked to. She said, you know, humans have been very abusive for the last few hundred years of Mother Earth. Uh, they pollute the planet with, uh, you know, the, their toxic chemicals and their noxious fumes. And uh, their pollution has really been escalating since the Industrial Revolution. And that really causes her a concern because it's, it's detrimental to her plants, detrimental to her other animals. And she really hopes that we can see our way clear to stop our pollution. And she said that, you know, um, she has nothing against the human race. You know, when we first arrived on the planet, we were very... Uh, you know, we more or less lived in harmony because we didn't cause a lot of pollution. We didn't have advanced technology. But since the Industrial Revolution, we've become like an invasive plant that's uh, killing all of the other plants in the garden. And we're basically taking over the whole planet, have taken it over, and, and, we're, and we're doing things that are very detrimental um, to the planet, to the other animals, and even to ourselves because we have to live in this planet. And so her message was, you know, look, you really have to stop this. And if you don't, it can go very badly. It can end up very badly for the human race. And then the surprising thing she said to me, Julia, was she said, you know, I, I have some power to, to manipulate some of the things that happen on my planet. Uh, you know, and she said she can actually uh, manipulate the natural disasters that occur here on a regular basis, like volcanoes, earthquakes, floods, uh, droughts, and so on. And she said that she's been manipulating this a bit lately, increasing the number and intensity because she wants to fire a warning shot across our bow. She wants us to wake up and recognize that 
the course that we're on can't continue or to end very badly for us and all the other creatures and plants on, on, on Mother Earth. And she sincerely hopes that does not happen. So that was really an amazing uh, conversation. And uh, a lot of people have speculated, Julie, as you know, over the past that there is our planet does have a consciousness. Mm -hmm. I, I clearly confirmed that because I had a conversation with, with Gaia and uh, it was really quite amazing. And I really hope that, um, just like the uh, Orca has said to us, that uh, you know humans really have to change course because we're really... Uh, really sort of going on a path that will end up destroying, you know, good portions of our life and even ourselves on our planet. And we need to change course, you know, very quickly before it's too late. Absolutely. Well, and that's what I've noticed. If you, have you noticed a lot of people shifting their attitudes toward Mother Earth? Oh, yes, absolutely. There's been a major shift in the last, uh, you know, 10, 15 years, a huge shift. And I think we're finally, a lot of us are really getting the message that we have to really change our ways. And I think there's some momentum going, Julia, to, to, to move in this direction. But we really need to have more and more people become aware of the right. problem and aware of what we need to do to fix it. And, uh, and, and you know, so I, I try to do my best in my books. Uh, you do the same thing in your radio show and in your books. And, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of messengers around the world who are trying to spread that message. And uh, it, it's really, uh, hopefully, it'll, it'll be... Uh, received by more and more people so that we can actually turn, change our course and turn things around and, uh, and make our world a better place. So that's ultimately the hope. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's wonderful. And there was something in your book, something about, um, uh, but I'll, I'll let you keep going, but I remember seeing something about like a fairy and, um, um, what we, yeah, I should tell you yeah. that yeah. speaking of Ireland, you just got back mm -hmm. from Ireland. I, yes. I was there a year ago. Um, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> after I had finished uh, my conversation with Gaia, I said to Albert, you know, I'm really surprised at this. I said, does, does Gaia have any more surprises up her sleeve besides the fact that she's a living, you know, sentient being? And he said, oh, yes. She said, there's, there's lots of things, you know, on our planet that, that, we're, that we're not really aware of or that haven't been proven. Um, and I'm going to show you a few of her secrets. And so one of the trips he took me to Ireland, and there in a, in a beautiful green uh, glen, and, and you know there's lots of those in Ireland, Julia, the yes, beautiful countryside. <laughs> yeah. There he introduced me to one of Ireland's uh, mythical creatures, a, a fabled creature, an Irish fairy, which really sort of surprised me. And she was, he, he went behind a, a bush and he came walking out holding her hand. And she was about three feet tall, uh, you know, very pretty, beautiful little creature. She looked like a tiny, perfect china doll. And we communicated by telepathy. And she said, yes, you know, fairies do exist. I mean, they've been uh, the stuff of legends in Ireland and other places for, you know, centuries and centuries. Um, we, we really do exist. And she said that uh, her story was that, that uh, before humans arrived on, on the, in Ireland, they were able to live openly above, above the surface, uh, roam freely, you know, uh, dance in the rain and, and, and bask in the sunlight and then all of a sudden, humans arrived on the island way back when. And she said at first, they thought that humans were just larger versions of themselves. And so they welcomed us with open arms. But they soon found out to their chagrin that we were violent and aggressive. And so they realized very quickly that they, they had to avoid us at all costs. And so they went underground, basically, to live underground cities. And so that's where they've been since then. And uh, they, uh, you know, they'll come out occasionally on the surface Occasionally, they're spotted by humans, but they try to avoid that. Um, and that's, so that's the story. They have to sort of live in hiding. They come out uh, at night uh, and where they won't be spotted by humans. Um, and they really long for a time when they can have uh, a, a, an open existence with humans, live on the surface, and roam freely again. And they want to live in harmony with us, but they just can't see that happening as long as we still continue our, on our ways of violence and aggression. So there now, when you, now, when you were in Ireland, did you see the fairy trees? Uh, where was that, Julia? Oh, well, there was different places. Um, oh, in you, fact, you it's, it's an actual tree, is it? Oh, there's different trees. Yeah, in fact, oh. there's a, a major highway that we were driving on to go to um, uh, to Limerick, uh, and they had to. They said that the, the when the, the construction of the highway was put off. 
Uh, and it cost, I don't remember the amount of money. It was, it was like millions of dollars <laughs> was, uh, to reroute the highway like a few feet to take it around this fairy tree. <laughs> uh, now, uh, I'm telling yeah, you. I wasn't aware yeah. of that story. It, it, yeah. it sounds like a very, uh, very neat sort of story. There are mm -hmm. a lot of people, as you know, who believe in fairies, and uh, I think that's really great that they are showing, they're altering the course of the highway to respect their uh, their environment. Yeah, yeah so that was, mm -hmm. yeah, that was very good. I don't, I, don't, there, I don't know if you saw any fairies or leprechauns, but uh, uh, yeah. I didn't actually when I was there in September. But I was on this astro trip. I saw this beautiful little fairy. Her name was Brina. And uh, again, her story was very much the same as the as the Orca and and Gaia, which was we really hope that humans will you know learn to live in peace and harmony with everybody around them, all the other creatures, whether mythical or real, um, you know, all the other animals, and uh, you know we're really on a course where we're seeing th they regard us as bad news, and, mm. and and we really need to change our ways so we can sort of uh, bring these people out in the open and let them live. Uh, lived their lives on the surface as was intended. So it was really a, quite a neat encounter. And uh, it was very, uh, you know, she, she, she was really very heartfelt in her message to me. She really wanted us to, uh, to, to try to change our ways because they really wanted to live peacefully side by side with humans uh, like they, uh, you know, and enjoy their, their beautiful green island like they had before humans arrived. So very interesting message. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. And well, and it's such a beautiful island. It'd be nice that that everyone would. I mean, it's just a matter of being aware and just you know, it's really not that hard. <laughs> it's just no, it isn't. But it's it just seems like. And I think that there's been there's been a major awakening in the last while, as you know, Julia. And mm -hmm. I think more and more humans are becoming more enlightened about. Uh, what we're doing and where we are in, in, in mm -hmm. terms of being spiritual, you know, uh, creatures having a human journey. And, and as soon as we realize that, 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 you know, all the other creatures are just like us and that they deserve our, our, our you know, dignity and respect and, and, and to be treated fairly, um, you know, as soon as we get more and more people doing that, I think the abuse will stop, but we have to get the message out. And that's really the, the goal that we have. And, and one of the things that Albert has enlisted me for I mean, I'm just one of his messengers. He has many, and he really hopes that uh, that I will convey his messages uh, in my books. And in his words, the reason he took me on the astral travels, Julie, was because he said, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I can tell you verbally what's happening around you, but it's it'll hit you over the head much better if you actually see what's happening and actually talk to some of these entities that are, uh, that are really at, at the wrong end of human abuse. And so that's why he, he, he took me to Ireland. That's why he took me to the Orca and to Gaia. He also took me to, to, to meet a Sasquatch as well in the Pacific Northwest. That, that meeting, of course, Sasquatch is another of our mythical creatures. That meeting was very similar. I, I, I met the, the, one of the Sasquatches. They're very real creatures. And again, they, they've been in hiding because they, 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 they just think that we're not uh, good people to be around. They were violent and, and aggressive, and they don't want to be captured by humans and, and, and put into a cage on a circus somewhere. So they stay in hiding as well. But, but again, it's the same message. Uh, there's a lot of these uh, so-called mystical creatures who've been the stuff of legends. There's actually more truth to that than most of us will give credit. And uh, those are just some of the secrets that, that Gaia has. Eventually, I'll probably discover a few more on my trips with Albert, but it's uh, really interesting to note, you know, it's the old saying, where there's smoke, there's likely some fire. So these legends just didn't just develop out of somebody's imagination. There is some truth to them. So very interesting adventures for sure. Absolutely. Okay, so then after this, then you went off, off the earth or what? Yeah, after this, uh, then uh, we went to the... Uh, well, he, he took me to another another planet actually because I had uh, I had asked him if uh, if there were other human civilizations on planets other than Earth, and he says yes, there are many throughout the galaxy, um, and uh, he, he said and a number of them are, are very have developed much differently from your own. He yeah. said I'll take you to, to see one which is really quite different, and so he did. He took me to a a planet many light years away. And there it was when we sort of touched down and we're traveling astrally, of course, it was a very sort of a modern uh, city with, uh, with modern buildings and flying cars and moving slidewalks and sort of like something that you might see in a science fiction movie. And there, there were humans and there was, there was men and women. The women are all dressed 
identically, the men were all addressed in a different way, also identical. And we went and had a conversation um, with the, uh, the ruler of this planet, and, and, and she was the empress. Her name was Marpesia. And she explained to me that um, their society was very matriarchal. It was entirely ruled by women. Uh, everything of importance was ruled by women, and men were not allowed to, uh, have a, to earn political office, to have a job that had any management responsibility, or even to vote. And she said that uh, the, the reason for that was that they, um, w one of their people a long time ago, uh, when their society was very patriarchal, ruled by violent and aggressive men, um, one of their women had a dream, a vision one night, that if she uh, went into the forest and, and harvested a, a plant that grows there naturally, and, and if she fed it to uh, her husband and to other men, their testosterone levels would drop drastically. And so she did this, passed it along the, the, the secret to all the other women. Gradually, over a period of a number of years, the men basically um, became very docile and compliant. Uh, they had no desire to, to run the, the, the planet or to, you know, to have, assume any position of power. So the women just naturally took over, and they've been a matriarchal society ever since. And now what they do is that for every male child, they chemically sterilize them at the age of three. And so they have very low testosterone levels. Um, they, but she said that the men are not uh, subjugated. They're not treated harshly. They're allowed to live happy lives where they can pursue recreational activities and sports and, and um, you know, gather, you know, you know, go to school, gather knowledge. They just aren't allowed to have any position of, of authority or power. And she says they're quite happy with that. They don't really care about that. And she says they never miss their sex drive because they never remembered having it. And so um, that's how their society was run. And she said they have a very peaceful, harmonious society. She said occasionally the women uh, who are running the, the, the planet will have disagreements, but they always resolve that in a very uh, amicable fashion. So there's no crime, there's no wars, there's no conflicts. Very peaceful, harmonious society. Um, and that's how they've been living ever since they discovered the secret to, uh, uh, of this plant growing in the forest. Hmm. And so... Very, very different. A lot of women out there will be cheering and saying, yes, that's for me. <laughs> when, when, I, when I left that planet, I said to, to Albert, I said, well, that's certainly one way to run a planet. But I wondered if there wasn't some happy middle ground between the extremes of that society and the extremes of our own, where we could have a middle ground where men and, e men and women were equal and happy and harmonious living together. And he said, yeah, that's the goal, obviously. Mm -hmm. So then I said to Albert, um, has this civilization ever visited our planet? And he said, no, they had not yet uh, developed the capability of traveling between the stars. And I said, oh, thank God. I was afraid I'd have to rush back and warn all the men on our planet. <laughs> so maybe maybe it takes yet. testosterone to do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that was a very interesting sort of glimpse at another human civilization. Uh, it was sort of like 180 degrees from where ours is. And hopefully, um, you know, um, hopefully, as I said, we can find some happy middle ground where men and women can, can be equal in every sense and live in uh, peaceful harmony on our planet. That's certainly a goal that, uh, that uh, I wish we could get to. And uh, I think we're making strides there, but we have a long ways to go. Yeah, absolutely. I think we are, too. I think there's, you know, you can see that people are, are really uh, shifting more and more. You know, men men are finding their feminine side, and women are finding you know their masculine side, and they and, and it's like people are balancing much more. And um, but then you you know then you have all you know all the periphery. <laughs> you, know, you have yeah. all the people out here on the sides. But yeah, I, I I think there is a lot of shifting going on in that way. Yeah, I, I think we're moving in the right direction. We just need to sort of push it along as best we can, Julia, and, mm -hmm. and help it along. Mm -hmm. so, so another interesting a glimpse at a, at, at a human civilization. This time it was uh, on our own planet. Uh, and, and I said to him, you know, his, you know, I know where our human civilization is and that we have a lot of problems to work out and, and we need to change our course. I said, you know, have uh, – and he had told me before that there had been other – human civilizations that had reached very high peaks in terms of, uh, of, of technology and so on. And they ended up crashing and burning. And a lot of them, of course, we're all aware of like Atlantis and Lemuria. And I said, you know, have there been any other ones of note where they've managed to sort of, uh, uh, you know, get rid of most of their problems, conquer most of their obstacles? 
And he said, yeah, it's very interesting. He said, actually, one of the first ones that uh, happened on our planet uh, was when uh, humans were actually seeded by extraterrestrials. And he said it was back 65 million years ago. And, and there was a human civilization that actually lived among the dinosaurs. Now, most archaeologists out there would say that's nonsense because humans haven't existed that long. Mm -hmm. But he actually did show me. He took me to the Akashic Records uh, in, on the spirit side. And we got, he gave me glimpses of this civilization that did live among the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And it was quite interesting because it was uh, not advanced technologically. They, they lived very close to nature, um, but they had a very uh, egalitarian society where men and women truly were equal, and they shared all the, all the duties, you know, the cooking, cleaning, uh, raising children, hunting, and so on. And um, they uh, lived in this big walled city with very high, high, high uh, pillars, uh, basically to keep the dinosaurs out. And I watched with interest as, as I saw a hunting party, half men and half women, who sort of crept up on a hadrosaurus and uh, managed to kill it with their spears. And then they quickly cut it up and slung the meat on poles and headed back to their city. And uh, they almost got there uh, when they finally heard a, a T-Rex come uh, roaring down the path towards them. And they managed to get into the city just before uh, the T-Rex slammed into the uh, the big wooden door. Um, mm. And uh, so it was, it was very interesting to see that there was actually humans living back then. What happened, according to Albert, was that uh, when the asteroid hit uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, it, it, it threw up uh, you know, a bunch of uh, dirt and smoke and everything else and caused a bunch of volcanic eruptions all over the planet, which basically resulted in a nuclear winter for a couple or three years. That's what killed off most of the dinosaurs. And unfortunately, this little human civilization, there was only sort of one settlement on our planet. It got buried under a couple hundred meters of, of lava which is why nobody has ever discovered it. But it was somewhere in the Central American area, is what Albert told me. So that, that was interesting. That, that was one of the first attempts at life on our planet, our human life. Um, and, of course, there's been many ones subsequent. But that, that, that civilization didn't perish because of things they did to themselves. It was just a, an accident of the, uh, of the cosmos, uh, asteroids slamming into our planet. So mm -hmm. very interesting is that... Uh, Humans have been around on this planet a lot longer than archaeologists uh, um, or anthropologists give us credit for. Oh, absolutely. And you wouldn't, I don't know if you've read any of mom's stuff, but you wouldn't believe how much that goes right along with her things. <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah, it, it, I haven't read uh, much of your mom's stuff. I, I've, I've read a few of them and they're, and they're sort of amazing books, but I, uh, I, I just sort of uh, run out of time. I'm very busy with what I'm doing. But, um, you know, what I did read was, uh, you know, absolutely that, that, that not only was your mom getting that, that message, but a lot of other people have also uh, brought the same message forward. And I think it's just a matter of spirit trying to get the message out through as many uh, messengers as, as possible to let people know that, uh, you know, you know we're, we're not sort of the, the only civilization that's ever existed and that others have been around before. And they really want us to not make the same mistakes that some of the other ones have done, like Atlantis and Lemuria. And we're really at that stage now where we can end up destroying ourselves like some of the other civilizations. And we really need to focus on changing our ways so that we don't do that. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. But, you know, as far as like, but the asteroids specifically, see, and that's, that's what messed everything up because it was supposed to be a perfect planet. Yes. And, and everything. Yeah, the, the, the asteroid yeah. didn't, didn't mess it up. And, uh, you know, and I said to Albert, um, you know, why didn't the, uh, of course, as you know, there's been extraterrestrials monitoring our planet for, you know, since day one. And uh, they've actually have seeded life on our planet, seeded yeah. humans several times. And I said, yeah. why wouldn't they stop, do something yeah. to the asteroid? And, and he said, well, um, they, they can only interfere if it's gonna, something's going to destroy the whole planet. And that was just an event that they had to allow happen. And mm -hmm. so, so how it played out was the dinosaurs more or less disappeared. Humans eventually were reseeded uh, back on our planet. And uh, now here we are, we're the dominant species, but it, it's just part of the sort of the uh, cosmological events that happen in our universe and they had to stand by and watch it happen. So, you know, yeah. and, and by the same token, they, they, they aren't allowed to intervene uh, to stop right. our wars and our conflicts, um, but they, they, they are apparently they're allowed to, if we're going to do something to destroy our whole planet, hopefully it never gets to that. Exactly. That's, I mean, you're almost speaking word for word. Yeah, the message, <laughs> from, the, the message from, from Spirit is pretty consistent, the core yeah. message. Um, That's and, what's and, so beautiful about it. You yeah. know, they all validate each other. 
Exactly. It gives, <laughs> it gives me nice confirmation when I hear other people say the same things or getting the same message. So it would be very disconcerting, Julia, if the messages were all different. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. so, so I think it's a good thing. So anyway, that was uh, a, another glimpse of a, of a human civilization on our planet. Uh, he took me to the spirit side a number of occasions. Um, you know, spirit side, the spirit realm, what exists beyond the, the veil, however you want to call it. Uh, you know, some religions call it heaven. Um, but, it, you know, as you know, it's a very wonderful place. There's no negative emotions. Uh, there's nothing but unconditional love amongst all the souls who live there. And that's really our true home. That's where we, that's where we really, uh, you know, that's what we call home. Um, th these little excursions to the planet Earth to incarnate as humans or other entities, those are just sort of side trips where we really exist in, the, in our true nature as beings of energy is on the spirit side. And so uh, it's a wonderful place. And, and I had a number of uh, uh, meetings with some very um, wise souls who had incarnations on Earth. Some of them were very famous. And one of the more famous ones was I had a meeting um, with uh, Jesus Christ. I mean, and uh, b before the meeting, Albert said, I'm going to take you to, to meet somebody who was a paragon of virtue and also somebody who was uh, uh, an evil monster on earth. And I couldn't imagine for the life of me, who, you know, who he was going to take me to meet. Mm -hmm. So we went down the path and, and eventually came to a bench and there was Jesus Christ sitting on a bench having a very friendly conversation with Adolf Hitler. And I was sort of taken aback, like how come these two opposites be sitting there and having friendly conversation? Well, after the introductions were made, the, uh, the, the, the soul who appeared to me as Adolf Hitler morphed back into his, what he called his natural uh, form on the, on the spirit side as a handsome young man named David. He explained to me that yes, he was the soul who had lived his last life on earth as Adolf Hitler. And he explained that he was very, very sorry and upset about all the horrible things he did while he lived on Earth. But he said those things had not been planned beforehand. Uh, they resulted from the fact that uh, he let his negative emotions get totally out of control. And so everything sort of spiraled out of control because of that and, and all the horrible things happened. And he said that he he's, you know, really... Uh, quite embarrassed about what had happened. Uh, he really intended to make amends. He wanted to reincarnate back on earth um, and, and try to do better. And he was having these meetings with Jesus because Jesus was giving him sort of some coaching tips on what he should sort of plan for his next life. But one of the interesting things, Julia, is that he said that he had met with all of the victims on the spirit side of the souls of his death camps. And mm -hmm. there had been total reconciliation because he said whether as difficult as it may be to believe, is that once souls go back to the spirit side, there's nothing but unconditional love for each other. And so nothing that happened to souls on earth sort of carries over into the spirit side other than the lessons that are learned. And so, you know, he said, he said to me, you know, if, if you're murdered, uh, you know, during your life on earth, when you, when you cross over to the spirit side and when your perpetrator crosses over, you won't feel any hatred or need for revenge against the person who killed you on earth because once you're on the spirit side you understand sort of how the cycle of reincarnation works on earth and you'll know that that was just a soul who uh you know who just went off course as a lot of souls do and you know now he's back trying to learn from his lessons and uh you know and you recognize that so that was really a an eye-opener to a lot of people on our planet julia as you know um, they feel that if somebody has done a horrible crime like commit murder or or genocide or terrorist act, they think and they feel it's justice for that person to pun be punished on the on the you know on the spirit side after after they die, but mm. that just doesn't happen because as you know there is no hell, there's no punishment, there's no judgment, so mm. everyone goes back to the same place. So that's a tough pill for a lot of people to swallow, but I sort of got it in spades because there I am uh, talking to the soul who was Adolf Hitler, who's one of the most evil monsters that we've ever had on our planet, and so there he was very sorry for what he had did, done and really trying to, uh, trying to plan his next incarnation so he could try to make amends because he had a lot of bad karma to, 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 to make up with some positive, uh, positive moves. And so then, uh, while I'm speaking with, with, with that soul, Jesus Christ is sitting there nodding his head and smiling. And I said, so, you know, what is your story? And he said, well, he was a master soul, still is, of course, who, uh, who was encouraged to incarnate on our planet over 2,000 years ago um, as, as the man, Jesus Christ. 
and he said that his goal was to try to uh, help humankind uh, make the next step up the spiritual ladder to become more spiritually enlightened. So his mission was to help humans at that stage of, of, of our development. And he said because he was a master soul, uh, he had learned to uh, focus his thoughts into very powerful beams of energy. And that is how he was able to accomplish his miracles, like walking on water, raising people from the dead. Um, and, and so he did that because he wanted to uh, attract attention. He wanted to attract followers. He wanted people to hear his message and to try to you know, follow in his path. And he said that um, it, when I said to him, well, if you could, if you could you know, create all these miracles with your power of focused thoughts, why didn't you stop yourself from being you know, crucified on the cross? And he said, I could have stopped that, but he thought that dying on the cross and then, then physically uh, ascending later uh, would have sent a very powerful message to all the people, all his followers, and it would have uh, you know, sort of kick-started a new religion, which he hoped would happen. He didn't quite realize how the Christian religion would develop you know, after his, uh, his death. Um, and he said, it's done a lot of good things, but it's gone off track in a number of ways. But he said, you know, that's life on earth. You never know quite where things are going to go, uh, you know, when you uh, sort of push the buttons and get things rolling. Um, but, you know, so that was his story was that, yeah, he, he came there to, uh, came to our planet to help us, did his best. And now he's back in the spirit side and, I, and, and watching what's going on. And I said to him, you know, do you ever, a lot of people think that there should be a second coming of Christ. Will this ever happen? He said, he doesn't know, but if the uh, council wise ones asked him to do so, he's certainly willing to go back. So hopefully, maybe one day he'll appear in our lives again. It almost sounded like, um, not to make light of it, but it almost sounded like um, uh, someone asking him, uh, you know, like some of these people in these shows and everything, you know, would you be willing to make another uh, return <laughs> show? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, well, if they ask me. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, you know, it's like there's not it's, – it's like it's all in the um, – it, it's not in that, you know. <laughs> anyway, it's really interesting. I mean, he, he, clearly he was a very wise, compassionate soul, a master mm -hmm. soul, very advanced, and I was really happy to have the conversation. I, you know, subsequent to that, I had another meeting with him, which mm -hmm. I detailed in my, which, in my fourth book, which I don't want to get into right now. But, but uh, you know, clearly he's, uh, he, he, he was a uh, – he, he was very much the, the the person that he was generally described to be. Although sometimes there was some editing and embellishment of uh, of the gospels. And like for one thing, what, what, what they edited out of the early gospels is the fact that Jesus was married married to Mary Magdalene, and they had he had children, uh -huh. and that was totally edited out. Of course, that's been speculated by a number of people. That was confirmed to me by Jesus himself, saying, "Yes, I had two sons and a daughter, married to Mary Magdalene, very happy marriage." And then after his crucifixion. Um, Mary Magdalene and his mother Mary smuggled the children out of the country to another country where they ended up living lives in obscurity and getting married and having their own kids. Um, and so uh, he, he just reaffirmed what a lot of people had been speculating, um, including Dan Brown in his novel, The, uh, uh, the uh, Da Vinci Factor, um, okay. or Da Vinci Code, I think it was. Uh -huh. um, and so he just really confirmed that to me. And uh, um, I, I actually had a, another brief encounter with his mother Mary on the spirit side just after I met with Jesus and, he, and she said, yep, um, not only did Jesus have children, but Mary herself had more children after Jesus. You know, she ended up with four sons and two daughters. Um, again, that was all edited out of the Gospels because they decided early on, or somebody did, that she was to have been a perpetual virgin all her life and obviously <laughs> she had more children. That didn't work and so they just... They just uh, they, edited out all the references to other children. And she says, you know, uh, she doesn't understand why they did that because she says there's nothing wrong with being a human um, woman and having children. I mean, that's perfectly natural. And she doesn't know why they decided that she shouldn't have to go through that uh, or at least have the, the story of her life change so that she was never had more children after Jesus. So very interesting encounter. And then another... Uh, before we sort of run out of time here, I want yeah. to tell you about a, a, another very interesting encounter I had with a soul on the spirit side. Um, uh, Albert told me that uh, he was going to take me to meet Lucifer. And I thought, well, Albert, that doesn't make any sense because you told me many times before that Satan does not exist. And he said, come on, I'm gonna, I want you to meet Lucifer. So it turned out that Lucifer was not 
the prince of darkness. He wasn't the, the alter ego for Satan. He was actually a very beneficial angel. And he said that he had been badly maligned over the years by some people who had equated him with the devil. But he said that's very far from the truth because I'm actually uh, you know, a, 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 bit, a beneficial angel um, who works closely with uh, the wise ones on the spirit side to try to help humanity in any way that he can. And he said that what he does specifically is to try to send strong messages to people on our planet uh, to try to uh, stop them from carrying out some very uh, evil uh, act or deed. And uh, it was very interesting. He gave me three examples. He said that uh, he sent a lot of strong messages um, uh, to Abraham Lincoln encouraging him to abolish slavery. So that was one of the things he claimed credit for. Um, he also told me that during the Second World War, he sent strong messages to the uh, Nazi scientists who were uh, trying to develop the A-bomb for Hitler to, to slow down, drag their feet, so that the bomb would not be available to Hitler before the end of the war, which obviously is good for the world that that did not happen. Mm -hmm. And then he said, and, and uh, uh, you'll probably remember this, uh, or maybe, maybe you're too young, but in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when Russia was trying to put a bunch of, of, of missiles in Cuba, only 90 miles away from Florida, and, and President Kennedy said, no, I can't allow that to happen. So he, he ordered a naval blockade of Cuba to make sure that those Russian ships carrying the missiles couldn't get in. I remember that. I was a young, I was 11 years old, and we all thought at the time that that could be the beginning of World War III. We were all scared. And Lucifer said he sent strong messages to Nikita Khrushchev, who was the leader of the Soviet Union at the time, uh, trying to uh, make him hesitate and not push the buttons that would start World War III. So very interesting. I mean, it was, yeah, I'm sure he has more, many more tales, but he says, you know, that's been my role. I, I don't always succeed because that's why there's still so many wars and conflicts and terrorist acts and so on happening. He says, I, can't, I don't always win, but those are three cases where I'm proud to say I actually did some good for uh, the human race on your planet. Very interesting conversation indeed. Mm -hmm. Very interesting, and it's probably just something, because um, as I've read things like from the old um, literature, and this is you know like you like you were saying earlier, there's a grain of truth in things. It's like in these names and everything, and it's like a lot of times the church just took something and then they built on top of it, and they probably took that name, and and they took okay what what he represented, and then they. Um, and they worked with that, you know, and like, okay, well, he, he's a messenger of, you know, like of evil, you know, he, he, he sends messages to prevent evil and they're like, okay, well then he is, you know, and they just kept building and building and it may have even warped, who knows? I mean, and, and then they just took it and they said, okay, well, we'll use that one to mean this, you know, and just using the fear angle and. Kept going. Yeah, yeah and, the, and the Christian holy men, in fact, holy men for most organized religions, they like to use fear as a tool to control people. Mm -hmm. and, and so, as Albert has said to me before, um, you know, the, the, they, they invented the devil, Satan, as a way to, to instill fear in people, to make them come to, you know, church every Sunday and to follow the rules and so on. And, and, and Albert says it's nonsense. There is no Satan. There is no, there is no devil. Um, you know, and, and, and poor Lucifer somehow got ascribed uh, w with that sort of characteristic of being the prince of darkness and the, the, the center of all evil. And he said, no, that's just wrong, and I wanted to show you that. Uh, yeah. But that's just the way of, uh, of uh, how, how uh, holy men over the, over the centuries have managed to distort, you know, the, the truth to, to sort of follow their own agendas. And their agendas is one of we want to control people. Um, and Absolutely. they've been very good at it. They've been very good Absolutely. at it. Oh, my gosh. I just noticed the time, Garnet. Um, there's like two minutes left. Let's give you your, your contact information, and then we can go ahead and with, with more adventures here real quick. So. Okay. Well, the best, the best way to source information about me and my books is on my website, which is uh, garnetschulhauser.com. That's hard to remember, but if you Google Dancing on a Stamp or Dance of Heavenly Bliss, you'll get to my website. And there's information on all my books. You can download a free excerpt. You can watch a book video. You can dial into my social media sites like Facebook and, uh, and LinkedIn and uh, Instagram and YouTube. 
Um, I have uh, on my YouTube channel, I have posted recordings of all of my radio shows that I've done since my first book was released. And this is show number 106, Julia. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. I know you're out there everywhere. You've done fantastic. Yeah, so. and so the, all those recordings are there. People want to dial into it. And uh, my email address is there, so I'd welcome comments or questions from your viewers. I'm happy to respond to emails from people uh, who've read my books or who just have questions. Wonderful. Okay, so we've got like a minute left. So what story would you like to end on or message or anything? Well, a lot of people have asked me about where did I get my title from, Dance of Heavenly Bliss. I was over in the spirit side and uh, Albert introduced me to a soul called Zotan. And what he did was basically much to my surprise was he sort of, we were chatting and all of a sudden he just stepped into me and uh, it was like a fusing of our two uh, uh, bodies of energy. Uh, you know, it was a ecstatic sort of exhilarating experience uh, where our, our atoms were basically co for a, a few uh, amazing moments. And then he stepped back and he said to me, you've just experienced the dance of heavenly bliss, which is mm -hmm. what he said, something that souls over there do frequently and openly as a way to express their love for one another. So that's where the book title came from, Dance of Heavenly Bliss. Oh, that's beautiful. So beautiful. Well, this has been wonderful, Garnet. Thank you so much and, and for sharing all of this. And and these stories are fantastic. And, and, and I know you just barely touched the surface of what's in this book. I know you have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I just hit some of the highlights. There's a lot oh, more in the yeah. book than will be spoken about, for sure. Absolutely. I encourage people to, to read it and get the full details. Yes, yes. And and then I can't wait to see where your next book goes. So <laughs> The Further Adventures of Garnet Schulhauser. So um um let's till next time um we'll we'll come back <laughs> and I can't wait. Uh, and what's the we, name of that one? What will be the name of that one? Well we're just uh, anticipating the, as if the the fourth book is entitled Dance of Eternal Rapture. Ooh, how cool. Yeah. And, so, and so, so, so hopefully it will be published, and then uh, I'd like to be back on your show again, Julia, to talk about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Well, everyone, this has been fantastic, and, and thank you again, Garnett. This has been wonderful. And um, uh, we'll see you. Um, I won't be here next week. I'll be gone for, again for another few weeks because I'll be out um, of the country. Um, so I'll be back. i uh, be the middle of October. And... Um, so I'll see you all then, and it's been wonderful, and everybody have a wonderful few weeks. Thank you, we love Julia. you. Thank you so much. Yeah, good night, Garnet. Good Thanks. night, everyone. <laughs>